on move yeah okay so sure. good evening everyone um and welcome to the final part of our neonatal themed week uh, apologies for the slight delay in us getting started um i am joined this evening by dr connor o'neill from the royal manchester children's hospital um who will be taking us all through neonatal sepsis uh, so over to you dr o'neill Thanks, James, um, or Dr. McIntosh. Uh, <laughs> apologies on the delay as well. That was uh, entirely my fault uh, and my poor technical skills. Um, so uh, hello to uh, whoever is listening. Um, as uh, James said, I'm Connor. I'm one of, uh, I'm a pediatric trainee, sorry, in the Northwest. Um, and uh, yeah, today I'm here to talk to you about neonatal sepsis. I think that a few of you have had I may have been in, uh, listening to some of the other talks this week, um, so hopefully today's will be of interest to you. Um, so to start with, um, what is neonatal sepsis? Um, does I don't I, I was planning to do this interactively, but I think this may be difficult if uh, if there are people in the chat. So um, we'll I'll go through the first slide at least, and then see if there is any takers uh, for next questions. So um, the first bit, neonatal sepsis, if I click on. Is, uh, refers to an infection in the bloodstream in a baby less than 28 days old. So important to differentiate um, just because, yeah, it's less than 28 days old, but obviously. Um, it's divided into early and late onset forms, um, and this differs um, by the mode of acquisition and therefore the time of onset. So um, what we will we'll see both of them quite frequently in practice, um, clinical practice, um, but uh, the one that we'll see almost uh, or in the postnatal ward particularly and the one that you'll see more of will be suspected early onset sepsis. Um, so the theoretical and the physiological basis of that is um, the is vertical bacterial transmission from the mother during the perinatal period. Um, so antenatally, the bacteria can reach um, via uh, from the vagina into the uterus, um, or through the blood into the placenta. Um, that is of, it's good to sort of keep that physiology and um, anatomy even in mind, just whenever you're trying to think, well, we'll talk a bit more about this in the, future, in the next few slides, but in terms of the risks for potential infection um, and why we treat and how we treat. Um, but, and then late onset sepsis, um, by contrast, tends to be a uh, result from postnatal environmental exposure to bacteria. Um, so some places I've worked, I mean, both in the literature and in clinical practice, um, it'll differ based on where people, where people will count things as early onset sepsis and late onset sepsis. Um, the differentiation for this, and I'll just touch on this briefly, I'll not go too far into it, but differentiation for this mostly lies in the fact that um, it, it can be different practice within what clinical setting you're in. So for example, if you're a baby that's been in uh, the neonatal ICU for if you've been if you're a preterm baby that's been there for say two weeks and then you pick up an infection at that point um, then that will be deemed um late onset sepsis similarly how and you'll be treated with certain types of antibiotics on the other hand if you're a baby that comes in at four days old um to uh, a e having been discharged at six hours of life um then you will almost certainly be treated uh for um well query sepsis in almost all cases, no matter what the cause is in clinical practice. Um, but you then uh, will, um, the different antibiotic types may be used. Um, so it, it can differ even based on, diff I've worked in different units that uh, they'll change they'll, the types of antibiotics, but also the timings. Um, so don't get too bogged down in that, just be aware that there's a difference and the antibiotics you use are different. Um, so it's important to be aware of that. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so um, the associated pathogens, as I said, so again, that's one of the other things. So um, and the reason why we give different antibiotics, obviously, uh, we should all be able to uh, think about the reason why we give different pa uh, antibiotics is because different pathogens are more likely to be at, uh, uh, at uh, the, the cause. So there are, there are obviously similarities here, but the main things we think about with early onset sepsis are the top two. So G groupy strep, um, GBS, uh, more colloquially known, or E. coli. So they're the two that we see a lot of um, in, in clinical practice when you do see um, positive blood cultures. Um, you can, you know, going further down the early onset sepsis side, um, they're the ones that you see probably less regularly, but you may see the odd time if you've worked in NICU a fair bit. And then on the right-hand side is um, the late onset sepsis 
um, uh, pathogens. So um, as I said, they're a bit different um, and tend to be uh, more related. So for example, staph, staph aureus, um, Enterococcus, Cloaculus, negative staph, um, they can be often due to, late onset sepsis can, they can be often due to, for example, in babies that have been in NICU for a prolonged period, um, things like line infections, things like uh, things that are more common um, in that type of a nature. Um, and then the, yeah, so that, that's the main differentiation to get your head around. Obviously, um, we'll keep this fairly basic today, but um, just to be aware that there is a difference there. So next slide, please. So why is neonatal sepsis important? Um, so um, the next bit will say that in 2015, um, a study um, identified neonatal sepsis uh, as the third most common cause of new newborn mortality um, and the 16th greatest contributor to years of lost life across all age groups. Uh, the sepsis case rate for case fatality rate is 2%, 20% uh, in term infants, 20% in premature and 30% uh, in those with uh, associated meningitis. Um, it's important to say that that's for people or that's for babies and infants that have been had proven true sepsis. Um, so in clinical practice, you'll hear a lot if you ever do work in NICU um, or even in pediatrics, um, you'll hear a lot of uh, quote unquote suspected sepsis. Um, so you'll see a lot of babies are treated for sepsis, um, but these cases, just to not to terrify you, <laughs> these cases are about babies that have been shown to have proven sepsis. Um, so it's probably equivalent. I mean, I can't. Be, I'm not sure if the adult figures, but um, you know, if, if adults are shown to be truly septic, then um, I guess I imagine the fatality rates may be um, in the same ballpark. Um, but and the other thing I wish I said to keep in mind is neonatal sepsis can be associated with multiple forms of develop, developmental delays. So we've all heard about the, you know kids with missed meningitis and whatnot. Um, and so um, obviously, if there has been a, a an insult to the brain through infection, um, then you would expect there then to be, especially whenever the brain's in such a um, immature form, there be you um, can often be um, associated a neurological delay. And so, and that's of note for going into the future. So, if a child does have, um, even with that few, uh, even if there is no neurological sequelae when they're an infant or sorry, a baby on the neonatal unit, and they've had proven blood culture positive sepsis. Um, and have their few weeks of antibiotic, IV antibiotics, then um, they will need follow-up um, from a neonatal, a neonatal consultant will follow them up in clinic just to see how they're getting on developmentally. So next slide. Um, how or why is it missed? missed? So um, this is uh, the bane of every neonatologist, a uh, midwife and pediatrician, um, and anyone that works with children and babies ever really. Um, so um, what we, even whenever I started within pediatrics, I must be honest, I'll be completely honest and say that um, this is the one thing that uh, I find really difficult. Um, neonatal medicine is extremely different to adult medicine. So the way I always sort of, whenever I speak to anyone that's doing NICU and finding it difficult, particularly at the start, I always say it is it's a real gear shift in your mentality in terms of how you think about things. So a lot of the time in adults, we're trained to try to exclude things and then treat accordingly and treat rationally. Um, using clinical skills, which obviously makes sense. Um, but uh, with NICU, it can often feel like you're doing the opposite. Um, and the reason for that is because um, they don't present in the same way. Um, so as with babies, they'll um, their initial, so the signs of potential sepsis may be, are very variable and can be extremely subtle. Um, and so the risk factors of core, the correlated risk factors can be extremely weak as well. So early onset sepsis looks often like uh, the normal postnatal transition um, from uh, yeah the, into the extra uterine environment. So um, for example, it's extremely common to see, um, if any of you will do an ECU placement, then you will see babies born um, with some increased work of breathing. It's extremely common to see some recessions. They'll often, especially if they've been post-C-section, there's a common condition called transient tachypnea of the newborn. Um, that you may have been spoken to about in one of these other sessions. Um, and it can be extremely difficult to differentiate between that and uh, potential sepsis in the, in the um, initial uh, few hours. Um, again, certain places will do that differently um, in terms of how they will treat that. Some places will go full hog to get at the get-go and just uh, start antibiotics immediately. And other places will sort of hold off a bit until there's a bit more of a clinical suspicion. 
Um, but again, the fact that we do that is uh, means that there is a fair bit of variation across the country and across the world even. Um, clinicians rely on serial observations so and risk factors as a result to try to, tr um, to treat things. So instead of you know speaking to an adult patient and asking how they've been and asking their symptoms and their signs and the usual typical history that we ask to go through things in terms of uh, identifying diagnosing and managing and um, with neonates obviously we don't really do that and the, the history sort of comes a lot more from things like risk factors um, so as i said here the study um in a study of 240 newborns with risk factors for sepsis only two of the 12 patients with, with true blood culture positive presented with signs and symptoms of sepsis while the remaining 10 were asymptomatic and um, highlighting the challenge of identifying infected neonates um, so, which sounds again terrifying, um, but it's not in the sense that. So, remember that those ten will have been picked up by risk factors alone, and I guess that study is just highlighting that the why we take the approach in uh, neonatal medicine that we do in terms of screening and treating babies. Um, again, I, I think a lot of we've had we have F 2s come through to our uh, level three unit uh, where I've just worked and. I think some people sometimes can think, why are we doing all this? I mean, clearly these babies are fine, but actually, you know, thinking, making sure people are signposted towards these types of studies is important um, so that we do understand even at a medical student level or an F1, F2 level that um, it is different medicine. It's not, uh, you're sort of, you're trying to find infections rather than waiting for them to come to you and treating. Um, so even though 95% uh, are diagnosed in the first 48 hours after birth, sepsis can still be missed. Um, and on the other hand, overtreatment is now being seen in some areas. And actually, you know, if anything, I know I've sort of given this big defense of treating, 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 but actually I'm definitely more on the hawkish end and try, uh, and yeah, you'll, you'll meet, a, if you ever go into pediatrics, you'll meet a huge range of um, neonatologists um, and some people, some, and some units are, and I've worked in units that are extremely, well, screen screening treated at uh, very low levels and somewhat will be much more uh, liberal and um, but we'll get on to that in a second so next slide please so what should i be looking for um so these are the um main types of things you look for again they're really dissimilar to what you'd be usually expecting in adults um and again the difficulty with neonates is, is that none of these things are extremely specific um so again a lot of these types of signs can be found both are normal findings within the extruder if in the uh, transition um, into the extruder environment, so after birth. Um, so it's extremely common for babies to have mild tachypnea, mild nasal flaring, a bit of grunting. Um, they, you may or may not know the physiology, but you know when babies come out after having, uh, if they've been a C-section, for example, um, they haven't had the chance to push the fluid out of their lungs that have been that's been in there since birth. So. Um, or sorry, that's been in there uh, in the in the um, in the womb uh, throughout pregnancy, um, and so if they haven't had the chance to go through the canal um, to push that fluid out, then what can often they're just yanked out, and so that's why that TTN can be really uh, is really common. Um, but again, it can be really difficult to tell between what's a congenital pneumonia and um, on what's not. Um, but so yeah, just close observation. Um, other things: tachycardia, um, hypotension. I mean, tachycardia is very common again, just, um, but uh, mild tachycardia, again, these things are within, you know, it's all about relativity. So if it's, you know, very high, then obviously be a bit more concerned and persistent, or if it's high whenever they're not crying, and that's a big, that would be a, a more worrying sign. Um, delayed cap refill, again, you'd be a bit more, you'd probably keep an eye on it more and diminished pulses would be a bit stranger. Um, and you'd be thinking more along the cardiac line to go if that was me, but, um, Again, these things are all just any babies can present with um, and can be within the range of normal. So decreased feeding, all babies in the first 24 hours of life have ups and downs with their feeding and it can be very difficult. Um, that also can depend on mum and how mum's getting on with um, how able she is. Um, things like irritability and um, temperature instability, bulging fontanelle, they're all really important to look out for. Obviously apnea is you'd be a bit more concerned about. Um, jaundice, um, again, this is um, some of the risk factors that are, uh, we'll come on to this in a minute, but um, part of the national guidelines. Um, and then things like new onset rash, physicals, erythema, swelling around joints, mottled skin. So I know on paper, all of those look, I get you, you think, of course, you know, of course I'd be worried. But actually, in reality, when you do go into NICU, quite a lot of those, actually, I would say the majority of those can even be within the range of um, a normal baby, um, baby's transition. Um, so all, uh, almost all babies will get some degree of jaundice um, in the first few days of life. 
even rashes um, there's a rash called erythema toxicum that is extremely common and um, i advise looking it up because it looks terrifying the first time you see it but actually is completely normal um and, and so just to keep an eye on and to keep your mind on those types of things but um just to be aware that it can be it's a really gray area when you're first starting out and just clinical more experience has been you sort of get your head around it so um next slide uh there we go. So red flag versus clinical indicators. Um, so this is the stuff I was talking about um, just recently. So I sort of was talking about the potential uh, things that we worry in you from a um, clinical perspective, from a clinical features perspective. Um, I've taken this directly from the NICE guidance. Um, and so the way NICE works, uh, NICE, I assure, assume you will all know, but is the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. Um, but they have a national guideline where they um, are... Uh, they treat for early onset sepsis in particular. So um, the vast majority of units will use that as their sort of Bible um, and they work on a basis of red flags or not. Um, so if it's a, if there is a red flag, you screen. So you start antibiotics no matter what. Um, so as I've said, these are can be fairly obvious. So for example, things like apneas, seizures, need for CPR, um, signs of shock, of course you're going to start antibiotics because uh, it's sepsis until proven otherwise in many cases. Um, the other things, though, however, are not red flags, and that's because, as I've said, they can be part of the normal transition. Um, and so, again, just so you're aware of all of these, so um, jaundice within 24 hours of birth, feeding difficulties, reduced muscle tone or altered muscle tone, um, persistent pulmonary hypertension, unexplained excessive bleeding, uh, signs of respiratory distress, et cetera, et cetera. I'll not go through them all again, but just so you're aware um, that actually none of those things alone make up a red flag. Um, but if there are two or more, um, then you do screen. Um, so oftentimes you're, you'll be caught out, or not caught out, but you'll be, um, some of the things you'll be looking for is, you know, if there's a baby that isn't feeding too well and um, and has had a bit of mild, uh, has had a, a bit of a mild increased work of breathing when they've come out. Uh, again, you're sort of, it depends what consultant you have on or what um, reg and stuff uh, in terms of who would screen and who wouldn't. And some would try to get away with sort of holding the baby for a few hours or, you know, keeping an eye closer for a few hours where some would screen straight away. Um, because, yeah, you're really within the realm of uh, clinical suspicion there. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and then, uh, so that's the red flags, risk factors. Um, and so I said, so you've got the clinical indicators and then you've got risk factors. And the risk factors are the things that um, within the NICE guidance um, talk about um, uh, that they can add. So if you've got uh, one red flag, no matter what you screen, um, but if you've got uh, one, if you've got a risk factor, or if you've got a non-red flag more than one, then you screen as well. Um, so for example, if there is a preterm baby with, um, so a baby that was born at 36, plus, even if they're born at 36 plus six, they still count as preterm technically, um, whose temperature has gone down a bit low. And then you're sort of, uh, again, you're in the realm of having to think about screening, okay? Um, you can sort of match these two tables up um, when you've got the slides at the end, but um, in terms of just having an idea when you're thinking, but these are the sort of risk factors that we're thinking about from a, um, and when you're going to deliveries and stuff, you sort of have in the back of your head with experience. Um, so things like if mum's been treated or has been found to be group B strep positive in the past through vaginal sw high vaginal swabs. Um, if mum's had a fever, so this used to be, a, interestingly, used to be a red flag uh, risk factor. So it meant that, um, or well, fever is still a fairly high risk factor, but what used to be was maternal sepsis. So, and uh traditionally the, the threshold within obstetric teams for treating maternal sepsis was extremely low so it meant that we used to screen a lot more babies than we now do um but the nice guidance has sort of changed to reflect that um so now it's based on fever rather than uh the mum having a temperature of 37.5 and a heart rate of 105 um as it used to be very common um but yeah these types of things pre labor rupture of membranes confirmed rupture of membranes for more than 18 hours for preterm birth so those types of things are tailing back to what I mentioned at the very start, which is um, if a baby, uh, if you think of, if you're thinking about the anatomy of it and you're thinking about the physiology of it, how an infection may occur in the baby, um, or it may come to a baby, then um, what happens is is that uh, you know if you've got a vaginal canal that um, the sac is no if the, if the membranes have ruptured and there's no protection to the baby, 
any longer, they can be exposed to the potential organisms within the general canal that can spread upwards. Um, and that's a fairly common, actually, um, mechanism or uh, of neonatal sepsis. Um, and then clinical diagnosis of chorioamnionitis. Amnionitis. Um, I would ask if anyone knows what those are, um, but I don't think anyone's typing anything. So I'll just continue and say that usually um, that would be things like, that would be from the obstetri obstetricians. So they would tell you if they've got clinical uh, suspicions. Um, and from a pediatric side, it's actually just that it's very, very smelly. Um, so if you've ever smelled chorioamnionitis, you will know, you will not forget that smell. Um, so moving on. Uh, next slide. This is touching on what um, I was just saying, um, which is about the management as per NICE. And so, as I said, every unit in the country should really be using this. There are exceptions that I can touch a little bit on once I've discussed this slide. Um, but largely, the vast majority of uh, units are using this, which is any red flag or two or more uh, of the risk fact, red flag, risk, non red flag risk factors or clinical indicators. You perform investigations and start antibiotics. Do not wait for any test results, so you give antibiotics immediately. Um, no red flags, but one non-red flag risk factor or clinical indicator, then you just use clinical judgment. Um, so is it safe to withhold antibiotics, et cetera, just as you can imagine. So you continue to monitor and what you'll usually hear, so if monitoring continue for at least 12 hours, so most units will have their own guidance on this. So for example, if a mum is, um, if a mum had group B, was found to have a positive group B strep swab in pregnancy, then, um, but they've you know there's been no babies come out it's completely fine there's no concerns and um, there's no other risk factors whatsoever and um, then they will observe for at least 12 hours um, some places will observe for 24 some will observe for just 12 um, but they'll do they'll do observations every two to four hours and, and if there's any concern then we'll come see the baby um and then yeah otherwise no concerns um so yeah that's the sort of it's fairly straightforward from a treatment perspective um or from a management perspective and then next slide so types of investigations, um, so yeah, the types of things that we investigate that we, we're looking for is the main three are FBC, um, which you'd be looking for any signs of uh, particularly high neutrophils. Um, again, it's not the most sensitive. Um, well, it is fairly sensitive, but it can be um, difficult to ascertain um, in the first few days of life, um, the, the true readings. and. Um, CRP, that's the vast majority of units, that's their primary way to sort of look at um, whether we should be treating or not. Um, Procalcitonin, I know, is coming in in a few places, um, but I think it's still, for in the neonatal period, because it's still not the most sensitive, um, I mean, CRP is not either, but we've been using CRP for years, so I think people know what they're doing with it. Um, and uh, I, but however, again, so what will often happen is the CRP is used as a measure to um, decide length of antibiotic course. So once you've started some antibiotics, um, CRPs, you'll end up doing things like called interval CRPs. So that's just seeing the trend over the next few days. Obviously, sometimes, as I'm sure most of you know, CRPs have a lag, and that's the same with babies. Um, but actually, you'll often say it go up initially because if there has been an insult to the baby, particularly in around the delivery period. What you imagine is when you screen them initially, say straight after delivery, and then you do the lap, the CRP inter interval at 18 to 24 hours after that, that's whenever you actually should expect to see if there has been a true insult or not. So that's why you often will see babies if they have been treated for suspected sepsis with not really any clinical indications or even just mild clinical indications, then if the CRP stays below a certain level, then the consultants are often happy, happy to stop. Again, that level is very, it depends on the unit. I've worked in a unit where if it was above 10, the baby's guaranteed five days of IV antibiotics. I've worked in a unit where if it's uh, less than 20, even if it's 21, 22, some consultants are happy to stop after 36 hours as long as the baby's otherwise fine. Um, and then blood culture obviously is of course the most important. Blood culture, a blood culture positive, um, any baby with blood culture positive, with true blood culture positive, I should say contaminants are quite common. Um, but if it's true blood culture positive and that's sort of different cat the fish and then you're going into a different realm of a workup in terms of uh, future thinking. And I touched on that earlier in terms of potential developmental and um, and also just other things, you know, we try to root out meningitis and whatnot. And that touches on lumbar puncture. So um, the indications for lumbar puncture from the NICE guidance and from sort of any unit I've ever worked in is um, if there's blood culture positive, um, a lot of the times, however, 
the baby's been on by the time the blood culture comes back as positive it's been about 24 or 48 hours and so if it has come back as true positive you will definitely do it if it's true positive and um, but if it's potential contaminant or if the baby's been on ivs for a few days the the clinical significance of a lung puncture isn't going to be particularly high um because they'll have been on ivs and so it may be a false negative um however you would usually do them straight quite quickly if there's a strong suspicion of bacterial sepsis I've spelled suspicion wrong there apologies um and um that would be things like if the baby looks really unwell or if the initial crps come back is quite high or if the other one's trending upwards so again every unit's different in the crp they want to treat on um, or they want to sorry do it on the puncture on like one unit i've worked in does lumbar puncture above crp of 15. one unit was they don't care how high it is it just depends on the baby's clinical condition and how strong your suspicions are which I would argue is probably better practice, but I've not been in this for many, many years or seen babies that have been missed. So, you know, who am I to judge? Um, otherwise, of course, things like not improving with antibiotics or any neuro signs, you know, the obvious things you'd be thinking about with lumbar punctures. Um, so, of course, um, if there are any neuro signs, um, then you'd also be thinking about doing some imaging of the head before cracking on with lumbar puncture, um, just so that you're not um, causing any other problems. Um, cool um, and the next slide is further management so that would be things like um, antibiotic choice um, so i sort of touched on this at the beginning um, antibiotic choice will depend on local sensitivities and unit um, if suspicion of sepsis but no clinical findings um, can be where i've worked in most places is iv keftaxime so keftaxime is usually the first one to give the reason for that it's broad spectrum and only to be given twice a day um, and uh, there is a good reason as to why uh, we don't give keftraxone, which is its obvious it's a sibling. But um, I can't, well, I would usually ask if anyone knows why, but uh, I'll just leave it. Um, if um, the reason why we don't give that is because of things like uh, the risk of uh, any biliary duct um, involvement and uh, in the neonatal period, that can be fairly important. Um, if admitted to NICU, um, so say, for example, you're a baby on the postnatal ward, you were screened and treated, but uh, more just for, not for actual signs, but more, and you're not actually worried about baby, then they can stay on keftaxime on postnates. If they're admitted, then they start in Ben Pen and Gent, and that's so you are properly covering right across the spectrum. Um, there's, in many units, there's this, and I think nationally, they try to push this golden hour thing. So some places are a bit heavier on it than others that have worked, but um, it's talking about within an hour, um, of cannula or of deciding you need to give the antibiotic um so usually that's like if you know if the baby needs to, to start then you need to just get a cannula and crack on um, and again most places i've worked to be honest the sho and the reg whoever's doing the cannula um they're giving the antibiotic as well so we'll have little kits that you do the cannula drop the cavitaxime and then just give it um within yeah straight away um, if they're someone that's just been screened, if they're coming to the unit, then we'll just do it, give them the unit and the nurses will do it, of course, but um, just to sort of expedite things. And then for late onset, so that's the sort of stuff I was talking about previously. So that's ones usually do with potential line infections. Um, so that would be often a combination of narrow spectrum antibiotics. So things like IV flu clocks and Gent is the first line where I previously was working. Um, but there are different concoctions out there based on different units. Um, so I just went on what I've come across most commonly, but yeah my main advice would always be just to have a look you, if you ever do work in NICU or in PEDS then you'll um, have this sort of drilled into you in your induction um, and there's always guidelines at any unit wherever you work duration of treatment just varies on the microbe identified so if you do have blood culture positive sepsis um, certain sepsis you need to certain microbes um, require um, several weeks of antibiotics and so that means they may need babies may need uh, longer term access so central access or um, yeah, even just pick lines. Um, yeah, so things like peripheral central access um, in order to sort of give antibiotics for a prolonged period um, because obviously it can be quite difficult to cannulate babies at this age. Um, but yeah, just a consideration. Cool. And then that is my final slide. Do we have any questions? I just really, I've sort of just spoken at you for half an hour. Um, and I don't know. I don't know if anyone is even out there. Um, if not, I've just been whispering into the world, into the abyss. Yeah, please do pop any questions that you have in the chat. There's normally a, a few seconds delay. <laughs> so um, but thank you, Connor. That was both very interesting and slightly terrifying. No. Um, uh, no. In PED surgery and visit the uh, NICU probably every day, but not have the same level of involvement. 
yeah. thinking about pretty much every single uh, baby that I must have walked past would have had quite a few of those risk factors or yeah, 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 potential yeah, yeah. to be. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's. I always just say that NICU is sort of, sort of just a. It's a mind of its own type of place. You know, it's it's a de- it's a world of its own almost. I mean, because it's so different even to just pediatrics. Mm-hmm. Pediatrics is different to the rest of medicine, but then NICU is just its own sort of fitting because it's the way we practice medicine and the way that we do medicine is just entirely different from the outside. Oh, was that a question? I just saw a one. Oh, thank you. Very informative. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I actually had a question with the investigations. Oh, please. Um, yeah. Is there any role for kind of source identification as we would do in regular peds or even adult medicine? Source um, actually, Yeah, so kind of, you know, working out is it urinary, chest sepsis, or actually do you yeah, just place yeah, it on yeah. the microbe? Yeah, so I didn't go too far into that, um, mainly because I didn't want to muddy the waters. I'm not, I sort of mm. been touching on muddying the waters a lot during this. Um, which is that it's very easy to sort of give a talk in neonatal sepsis, but in the real world and clinical practice, a lot of the times you're obviously, as with any, whether it's neonates or adults or peds or whatever, you're thinking of the wide spectrum of stuff. Um, and so from an investigation's point of view, if you've got a baby, I, I mean, it, it just depends what they do present with. So while they may not, they'll present with sort of similar stuff right across the board, there's only like four or five ways in which they present with stuff. But for example, if they've got um, recessions and they're, uh, working hard with their breathing you know always do a chest x-ray sometimes you pick up a congenital pneumonia they're like not that common but i've seen a fair a few um those will be uh definitely um something to keep an eye out for um in the um so yeah you'll, you'll always to be honest if it's a baby that's been admitted to NICU uh and that's uh got any chest uh signs then you'll definitely do a chest x-ray hmm. urinary stuff you wouldn't really touch on to be honest unless and that's more in the late onset sepsis bracket um so that would be if it's a baby that's uh had catheters or it's just a baby that's been on the unit for a while or a baby that's went home gone home sorry and then has um come back into the peds unit um into peds any and then in that case you'll definitely you're you're right in that sort of in that sort of in peds we talk about that first three months there's um if a baby has a fever you'll sort of give ids and screen straight away and give antibiotics mm. urinary is almost always or it's very often sorry i shouldn't say almost always but it's very often um the main thing you think you're thinking about and you're worried about um but in this sort of i've i'm a baby that's just been born and mm. uh, yeah there's very i've i've i feel like i've I've very rarely seen um, sort of anyone chasing up urine because I guess you know the the theory for that isn't there isn't really any theoretical basis for that in terms of how a UTI develops. The only ones would really be if there's babies with, but even then, like you know, baby hasn't peed, for example. Mm. You know, it's not gonna. The system hasn't worked so much to speak, and so the the potential yeah. for a mic for an or for a um, infective organism to work its way in is less. Um, and that sort of takes a bit of time um hmm. and and then you're thinking about the, and then if that if you do identify something you're thinking about you'd be always thinking about things like um if there's any other structural anomaly so things like uh retrograde valves or puj obstruction pelvic you know, ureteric obstruction and things like that but in yeah, the early onset the weird and wonderful as well i've seen a few yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but in the early onset sepsis yeah, I guess it's the one, it's the one real different thing from adults, which is mm. that you probably wouldn't really uh, go into urine too much. Um, and then, yeah, I'm trying to think what other things. But yeah, otherwise, no, it's just, mo- it is mostly chest would be the thing that you'd be looking for. And then, mm. but like, because, yeah, the blood culture is the main thing. Like, that's always, the, that's the thing that's drummed into you if you're doing a new place. Yeah. Blood culture, blood culture, blood culture. Mm. Because you, you want to make sure that they're not blood culture positive. Of course. Um, and then I actually have another question. There's no, no one else um, has any questions. Um, with, and it might be a silly question, but with yeah, say yeah. a near, like a very small neonate mm-hmm. whose mother or father has a penicillin allergy, say, uh-huh. how much stock or worry is put into that? Or no. would you still go straight ahead with penicillins and just kind of manage issues yeah, as they yeah. come up, as we do in small children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you just yeah? crack on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I right. mean, you, I mean, you know yourself, like, mm. I, was, I was gonna say half, but I almost say the majority of 
penicillin allergies or uh, how true are they yeah um, intolerances exactly um, exactly or allergies to things that used to be in your penicillins yeah exactly and so if a parent comes and say you know i am definitely allergic to everything that i touch and uh, mm. you know i have this weird and wonderful syndrome where you know my but you'll be doing that already but a lot of the mm. times parents are hyper anxious about and understandably mm. very anxious about these types yeah. of already so mm. uh, kind of it's almost it, people screen themselves not always but you know you'll often find that like um the things that uh you should be looking out for or you're often like 10 other people have done it for you before that baby's even delivered um and then uh, but yeah with things like a penicillin allergy because there's such a range there it's not something we mm. tend to be too concerned about and then obviously if there's any clinical findings the baby's in the right place anyway so yeah yeah of course you can treat um, but i don't think i've ever seen a, a, a neonatal acute true anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis. Well, long may that continue yes please god now, now you've got me worried <laughs> okay perfect well thank you very much uh, no, no, thank you. that was a very informative talk um i will just pop the link to the feedback in the chat um, and it'll also go out to everyone that attended um and the talk as always will go up on youtube within a day or so um, please do take the time to provide us with some feedback. Um, yes. As we always say, it's useful for our portfolios, but also as teachers and educators, we do want to get better and we want to give you guys the best possible experience. And the only way that we can improve on things is by you telling us what was really good or what you perhaps change if we were to do it again. Okay, I will let everyone enjoy the rest of their evenings. Um, thank, you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, James. All the best, though. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye.